Well, we are in part four of a series called Finding Purpose. And uh, so far, we've examined three different things. This was the introduction to our message. Uh, we've looked at the purpose of purpose, the purpose of passion, and last time we were together, we looked at the purpose of perspective. Perspective is crucial. It's crucial. I mean, all of these things are crucial, but I think of the purpose of perspective as being one of the most important things in terms of our introduction. Several things I want to point out just real quickly from last time we were together. We talked about that there is a difference in worldview. There's a difference in worldview. Matter of fact, we have what's called a biblical worldview. That's what they call it. We look at things through the eyes of Scripture. We have to look at things through the eyes of Scripture. The world looks at things in a worldly way, and we look at things in a biblical way. So you can only, you can only understand and imagine why the world comes up with some of the solutions that they come up with. We have an eternal view, and they have an earthly view. I mentioned that last time we were together. And for the world, for the world as, uh, as what they're taught, what they are trained in, their, in school, in public schools primarily, but as they're trained, they're trained to believe in this thing called evolution. And if a person believes in evolution, that we are just here by an accident, then we have no purpose. But if it is true that there is a God and he created us, then we have a purpose because nobody creates something without a purpose. That's the difference in views. If we look at things with a worldly view, we'll end up with worldly results and an eternal review, uh, view will end up with eternal results. So it is, we see things so differently than the world. And we ask ourselves, as we scratch our head, we say, why do they look at it that way? Well, they have a different perspective. Perspective really is important. So that's our introduction. We're going to move on to, um, and I have uh, <laughs> got a lot, of, a lot of material I want to cram in here this morning. The purpose of work. The purpose of work. Now this is not meant to be some exhaustive doctrinal lesson on work and, and certainly there are a, there is a tremendous amount of material out there if you want to look up the doctrines of work and, and, and all of the theology behind it. This is meant to be an overview. It's a broad overview. It's a generalization and I've tried to simplify it into basically three points. But let me give you an introduction. First of all, let me say this, that work is not a bad thing. Work is not some filthy four-letter word that we say, boy, we got to go to work again in the morning, and I work a nine-to-five job, and there are people, plenty of people out there who, who, who hate their jobs, who hate work. But let me tell you, work is not a bad thing. As a matter of fact, work is God's plan for us. Did you know that? That God created us to work. God created us to work in a perfect environment, in a blissful, divine utopia of the garden. God said, I am going to create man, and I am going to put man in the garden, and he's going to guess what? He's going to work. Matter of fact, it says that right here in Genesis 2.15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to tend the garden. That was God's plan for us, was to work in a perfect state, in a state of innocence. This is not a judgment. Work is not a judgment on mankind. Did you know that? There are some people who think that, that I just I have to go to work, and I just am so tired of my job. And Now listen, we can be tired while we're working. But work is not the punishment. Work is not the punishment. This is not a punishment for wrongdoing. One commentator, he said this. He said, even in a state of innocence, we cannot conceive it possible that man could, he could uh, have been happy if inactive. We can't even conceive that. If man could be happy inactive. He goes on to say, God gave him work to do and his employment contributed to his happiness. For the structure of his body as well as of his mind plainly proves that he was never intended for a merely contemplative life. 
We were not created just to sit around with our feet up and, 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 and do nothing. We were actually, God's divine purpose is we were actually created to work. So when we talk about the purpose of work, we have to understand this is God's plan for us. God's plan is that we work. Mankind was not created to sit around and do nothing. Now, let me say this. Rest is important. Rest is, is crucial. You have to rest. Man was not created just to work. But he was created to work. Now, let me say this. The curse was not the work. Work, work was not part of the curse. Do you know that? You know what the curse was? The curse was hard work. The curse was hard work. Look at Genesis chapter 3. First of all, let me say this. The curse goes two ways. One for mankind, one for womankind. Basically, one to the male, one to the female. Here's what he says. And unto the woman, this is the curse, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall have rule over thee. There's a lot of doctrinal things there we're not going to get into. And unto Adam he said this, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed, not is the work, but is the ground for thy sake, in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Listen to this. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Now listen carefully, friends. The curse was not the work. The curse was hard work. That's what it was. The curse was the, the thorns and the thistles that were brought forth from the earth before tending the garden was easy. I can only imagine. I mean, I don't know how many of you had a garden that's easy. Many of us don't. We use things called preen. <laughs> and we use things, chemicals and herbicides and insecticides and all sorts of sides of things that you eat, by the way, and are probably not good for you, which are cancer-causing, which we won't go into that. But here's the reality. It was the hard work that was the curse, not the work itself. And some people say, well, I just can't stand my job, and I just don't like where I work, and it's just way too hard. That's part of the curse. Going to work is not part of the curse. It's the hard work. I've often said that if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. And while that is true, in one respect, it is also not true because even if we love what we do, it's still work. I love what I do. But that doesn't mean that it's not hard work. That doesn't mean that I don't get here early and stay here late and I work throughout the day and I make phone calls and all these things. And, and sometimes we, we plant grass seed and plant trees and get blisters. And sometimes we do things we don't necessarily like to do. But I love what I do in a broad sense. Love what I do. That doesn't mean that it's easy. So let's look at three different things. Three things real quick. <laughs> I say that. It's not going to be real quick. But let's look at three things real quick. First of all, three basic principles. Work so you can help yourself, number one. That's the main point. A second main point is work so you can help others. And the third main point is work so you can please God. So work so you can help yourself, work so you can help others, and work so you can please God. Let's take a look at this working so you can help yourself. Now, Proverbs is chock full of, of, of labor, of, of things that are profitable. And, uh, and when I read through Proverbs, I find a lot of things about work. Solomon, who penned down the Psalms, was a worker. I mean, he was a magnificent worker. You probably couldn't find a harder worker than Solomon in that day. So he wrote down some Proverbs, and several of the things he said well, all of them have, have awesome validity and strength to this idea of working. But work so you can help yourself. He starts out by saying this in Proverbs 12, 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. And that is to say that if you want to help yourself, you need to work. 
And you need to work hard. The hand of the diligent, that's somebody who's actually going to get out there and plow the field. Now let me just say this. As we talk about work, there are two types of workers. There are the workers and then there are the workers. <laughs> and anybody who's a worker understands what I mean by that. There are the people that go to work and get a paycheck and don't actually work hard. And then there are the ones that will outperform anybody else. Y'all know those workers, right? Hopefully. Y'all know those workers that can, that can work other people's, I mean, under the table. They're just so hard workers. That's the diligent that he's referring to here in Proverbs 12. The hand of the diligent, they're the ones that are bearing rule. They're the ones who are the leaders. They're the ones who are the employers. They're the boss. They're the ones at the top of the food chain because they get out there and they get the job done. But the slothful, now that's a group that shall be under tribute. Those are the employees. Those are the ones that are less, maybe less diligent. They're less risky. You know, there's a risk reward. The people who are at the top, those are the diligent ones. They're the ones who are the leaders. And we ask ourselves why, we ask ourselves the question, why are those people in authority? Why are those that are in authority in authority? Because they are diligent workers. Those are the workers. They're the group of workers that are the workers of the workers. You all know what I mean. The people who get up early and stay up late, they work extra hard. Now this doesn't mean that the hard workers are, ne are, are, are less of people, or the, that the, the, those that aren't as hard workers are less of people. It just simply means that the workers, the ones that are really aggressive and the diligent, those are the ones that are going to bear rule. Those are the ones at the top. The purpose of work is that you can that it provides you a place of leadership. Provides you a place of leadership. Number one. Number two. The purpose of work is that it satisfies your desires. It satisfies your desires. Proverbs 13 says, The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. Now let me tell you this. We all have desires. The diligent and the sluggard both have desires. But there's a difference between the two. The difference is, is that the soul of the diligent is going to be made fat. The soul of the slothful, the sluggard here, the sluggard, the slothful, the, a great waster, they're all kind of in the same category. The soul of the sluggard desires, but they don't have what it is they want because they're not diligent workers. Now, there's a couple of reasons, primarily because you're, you don't work hard, but also because I think God has a, has a real uh, blessing in this. Those that work hard, I think it pleases God, and they're blessed of God financially. And therefore, they purchase those things which they desire because they work hard. We have to say, those people who are out there working hard have what it is they want because they're hardworking. Working is God's plan for us, and the purpose of work is that you can help yourself, primarily by uh, putting you in a place of leadership and also giving you what you desire. Another purpose of the work is, uh, for yourself is that, uh, is that there is profit. There's profit. And he says here in Proverbs 14, in all labor there is profit. All labor there is profit. In all work, there is something to be gained. There's value. But the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Penury is Poverty. So you all know those people, right, who, who work hard and don't talk, and then we know the people who just talk, and they, they, kind of, they, lean on their, they lean on the shovel, you know, as opposed to move the shovel. Now, I can move a shovel and talk. And I think a lot of us in this room, I mean, I don't think I'm talking to a bunch of sloth or sluggards. I mean that. Truly, I mean that. What I'm telling you is that there's a great populace of Christians out there who, who do more leaning than they do digging. You all know what I mean. And when we work hard, there is a reward. There is a reward. Now, I've told people this. I said, people don't realize that poverty comes because people talk. Poverty comes because people don't properly uh, uh, um, allocate their time. And I've told my staff this. I said, 10 minutes. 10 minutes 
a day wasted is 60 hours a year. That's a, that's a work week. That's a work week. 60 hours a year, 10 minutes a day. If, if we do the talking and we don't do the moving, if we're not active, I mean, what can you accomplish in 60 hours of labor, of working diligently? What can you accomplish in 60 hours? Potentially a whole lot. And if you get paid 20 bucks an hour, you're going to buy yourself a new grill. You're going to buy yourself a new lawnmower, a couple lawn chairs, a fishing pole. And uh, I mean, you're going, to find, you're going to buy yourself some things, right? Because you've worked hard. And that's a good thing. Working hard is very, very important. But only talking leads, leads to poverty. So 10 minutes a day of wasted time is 60 hours a year. And you all know that you waste more than 10 minutes a day, right? We all waste more than 10 minutes a day. I don't know. I look at my weather app more than 10 minutes a day. Okay? We waste a lot of time. How many of you spend three to seven hours on Facebook? Don't, add, don't raise your hand. I'm only kidding. <laughs> we waste a lot of time, bottom line. We waste a lot of time. And the purpose of work is that there is profit. Another purpose of work for yourself is that it can be just very simply just to eat. I know it sounds really basic, doesn't it? But the Bible says this. It says it in 2 Thessalonians 3.10. It says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. If you don't work, you don't eat. Now, that's a biblical principle. Does that sound tough? No, it sounds biblical. Now, what's great... What's great is that the context of this verse, the context of that verse actually goes back a few verses, verse 6. And what makes the context even stronger and the content even that more impactful, he goes back to verse 6 and he says this, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which ye have received of us. Do you know what the disorderly brother in this context was referring to? One that did not work. Here's the, here's the setting. In the church of Thessalonica, there were people who forsook their work and wanted to join the ministry because they thought the Lord was going to return that night. So they said, you know what? I'm not going to work. I'm just going to be involved in the ministry. And so what ended up happening is those people in the ministry began to be a burden to the other people. See, they took it too far and they began not to work. And then they began to be a burden on the other people who were the workers. And he says that those people are the disorderly ones. And he says to withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh dis disorderly. Any person who's not working, he says, get away from the lazy people. Get away from the sluggards and the sloth. Don't be, don't be with them. Why would he say that? Here's why he said that. He said, you don't want to be associated with them lest other people think that you condone their behavior. Don't be affiliated or associated with people who don't want to work. Friends, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. Christian workers ought to be the best workers in the world. Christian workers ought to be the pace setters. We ought to be the ones that the world looks up to. We ought to be the ones that they say, that guy right there, he knows how to work. And so oftentimes, it's not that way. So oftentimes, people look at the Christian and say, that guy is no harder worker than, than the other guy. And here he's saying, get away from those people who don't know how to work. Because other people are going to think that you agree with that sort of behavior. And the bottom line, he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Stay away from idleness. This is unacceptable behavior. God has created us to work. He has created us to work, and you know what? That helps ourselves. It really does help us. Okay. We looked at that. Now let's look at helping others. Work so you can help others. The purpose of work is that you might provide for your family. The purpose of work is you might provide for your family. That's helping others. He says in 1 Timothy, Paul says this, if any uh, provide not for his own, especially, especially those, listen to this, for those of his own house, 
He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He says, if you don't provide for your own, for, your, for others, in your own home, especially those of your own household, you have denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. How are you going to provide for your family if you're not working? Unless you have big inheritances, which are fine. But you got to work. Even if, you, even if I had a if, if hundred million dollars, I would still work. And you want to know why I would work? Because it's God's plan and it's good for you. It doesn't mean that you just don't work. There are so many families out there that I know that suffer because the parents aren't doing what they need to be doing. They're not the ones working. And, and, and let me tell you what, parents, we need to teach your kids how to work. We need to teach your kids how to work. Because eventually, one day, they're going to have their own families, and if they've learned from us how not to work, do you think that they're going to automatically just have this revelation of, oh, I'm just going to work now, because now I have a family. If you don't provide, you're worse than an infidel. You know what an infidel is? That's an unbeliever. That's a non-believer. There, you know, there are many non-believers out there that understand their responsibility to provide for their families better than a lot of believers? Imagine that, that an unbeliever is setting the standard for work ethic. We should be out there outworking, outperforming everybody out there. There are people that outperform the Christian. Why? Why are people outperforming the Christian when we should be the ones that the world looks up to that says these people are the workers? Failure to provide for your family, in fact, becomes a denial of your faith. You've denied the faith. That's what it says. People who don't provide for their family, they're worse than an infidel, but they've denied their faith. That, that means they've, they've, they've denied their God, knowing God. You see, people, people they, 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 they hear what you say, and they, and they see what you do, and they don't harmonize. And I have to ask this question, why can a person who is created with purpose not work with the same purpose he was created with? Why is he out there doing what he does so half-heartedly? And we'll talk about that in a moment. The purpose of work is to provide for your family. The purpose of work is also to provide for the needy. Provide for the needy. And this is how you help others. Ephesians 4.28 uh, says this, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to them, to give to him that needeth. One purpose of work you do is to give to those that don't have what they need. Now there are two different groups of people here. I want you to be very, I want you to understand this. There are those that, that work and don't have what they need, and there's others out there who will not work and choose not to work and do not have what they need. I don't believe that that's what this group is talking about necessarily. I think there are the sloths and the sluggards out there who choose to be lazy and idle. Those people are not our responsibility under, the God, under, under Ephesians 4.28. What I think he's talking about here is those people who have need but are working. There, let's face it, there are people out there who work and have needs that are not being met. And you know what 4.28 says? He says, God has given you work so that you can work to provide for those people who have needs that are not being met. Simply that is that God has given you the ability to meet their needs. The purpose of work is also to provide for the weak. Not just the needy, but for the weak. That's right, the purpose of, of us working is to provide for those folks that are weak. I believe that this is, this is the group of people who would rather be working but cannot work because they're weak. Not saying that they don't have strength in terms of muscles, but I'm saying that they don't have the ability. He says this in Acts uh, 20, 35, I have, shown, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. Labor, support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is similar to those that are needy, but it's referring to those that, are, that aren't able to support themselves. Not that those that are able, 
but those that aren't able. Let's face it, there are some people who through no fault of their own are weak and unable to work. And you know what? God has given us the ability to help them meet their needs. We're able to support them. Now, does that mean they need to drive a better car than us? Not necessarily. Okay? Not necessarily. This is not talking about some mass redistribution of wealth and we give away all of our money. That's not why I don't believe in that. I do believe that there are people out there who are incapable of working for themselves, though they would choose rather to work for themselves. But they have needs because they're weak and incapable of working. We find this again in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, where it says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. In Romans 15.1, he says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Now here, I'll tell you this, because I really believe this. I, I, I think that we do need more programs that help people who cannot, not who do not want to, but cannot support themselves. I really believe, I really truly believe this. There, the reason why the world, why the government has taken up this chore is because the Christian has, has, has not uh, borne that responsibility. Listen, why does the world provide the food pantries and the homeless shelters? I'm not saying that I'm going to go build a food pantry and a homeless shelter. What I am saying is this, that because we don't meet the needs of people when we have the ability to meet their needs, the world has picked it up and done it. And you know what? They're not given the gospel at these food pantries. And you know it as well as I do. They're not coupling the gospel message with food. They're not doing it. They're not giving out a heaven tract. They're not telling people that the power of God unto salvation is the gospel. They're not telling people that. They're not telling people the good news of Jesus Christ. What they're out there doing is they're giving them a can of this and a, and a box of that and they're sending them on their way. They're not doing it the way we ought to be doing it. But we have not done it. Because we are not supporting the weak. And we are not helping the needy. Most people in, in, in the world, in the government, they're, they're, they're enabling those people that actually do have the ability to work but choose not to. And that's where it's falling apart. They're not doing it right. They're going about it the wrong way. And so we as a church do have a responsibility to help these people. I'm not saying every person that walks down the street and holds his hand out, you give him $20. I'm saying that there are truly people out there that need help. And we have not done a good job at helping them. And so what you find is you find other people picking it up and they're not doing a good job at it either. We should be helping the hungry and the homeless and the veterans. Lastly, we work so that you can please God. So work so you can help yourself, help others, and now please God. Work so you can please God. Your work glorifies God. Listen to this great verse, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God, no matter what you do, and everything in between. Whether you eat, drink, and everything you do in between, do everything you can to the glory of God. Don't let anything be done without excellence. Don't let anything be done without excellence. Did you hear me, church? Do everything that you do to the glory of God. Don't ever settle for good enough. That's, I hate that attitude. Oh, this is fine. It'll be, it'll be fine. Is it good? You don't work for me and you don't work for your neighbor. You work to glorify God. One of the questions that I ask, we have uh, uh, business meetings, <clears throat> theoretically every Monday, though it doesn't always happen. Usually it's once every three weeks. But one of the questions that I ask the staff when we sit down, one of the first questions I ask, what can we do better? We will, we have, we will never arrive but we always have to shoot for doing something better than what we've always done in the past because we don't serve me. We don't serve each other. We serve God. There's a reason why we shoot for excellence. Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Do it as if you have God standing there in front of you and you are working directly for him. Most times what happens, friends, is this is just true. We think that we're there to serve our boss. Now, we work for our boss, but we serve the Lord. 
Therefore, whatsoever we do, do it to the glory of God. Make sure that we don't do things half-heartedly. And that's the next point, is don't only, do, your work pleases God. Work, your work glorifies God, and your work serves God. And he says, the servants uh, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as man-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, we're going to talk about that verse next week, but this is the one I want to get to. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. You don't work for me. You work for God, ultimately. You serve him. We are his servants. He is our master. And when you work, you're working to please him. Now let me say this in conclusion. Let me say this in conclusion. This is important. Get this. Work now because there's going to come a time when you can't work any longer. Here's what Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might, for there is, listen to this, no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You're not going to be able to work when you're dead. You have one, cho- one, one shot at this. You have one chance to work to the glory of God and to serve God. You have one chance So therefore, everything we do, let it be done to the glory of God with excellence. Work is not our punishment, friends. Work is not our punishment. It should be a pleasure to work for God. And when we have the right perspective about who is our master, about who is our Lord, who who are we really actually serving, when we have the right perspective on that, It'll transform your entire life. You will not punch in a time clock because you say, well, I'm going to work and I hate my job. You will say, I'm going to do whatever I did yesterday better today because I don't serve my boss, I serve God. And I am going to be the example to the world on how to get it done and to do it with excellence. Enough half-heartedness, enough it's good enough Enough of the, that, that lingo where we're just doing enough to get by. Do what you do, whether, though, whether therefore you eat or drink. Do it to the glory of God. This is a remarkable thing. When you try to find purpose in your work, when you put your hands to the plow and you say, Lord, why am I getting up this morning? Why am I doing this again? I punch the time clock. I work nine to five. I'm working half of a third of my life is dedicated to work. Essentially. One third is dedicated to work. The other third is dedicated to sleep. The other third, God says, do whatever you want with it. As long as it glorifies him. And you ask yourself, when you get up in the morning, why am I doing what I'm doing? And you say, Lord, it, it, it benefits me. It benefits others. And it pleases God. And if we can do that, If we can do that, you'll go to work tomorrow morning. You'll go to work tomorrow morning because a lot of us work. Go to work tomorrow morning and you'll actually begin to enjoy it even though it's hard work. Even though it's hard work. Now, let me just conclude with this last thought. That hard work does not necessarily mean long work. Okay? That does not necessarily mean that we have to work 23 and a half hours a day. That is, not, that is not the point. Oftentimes people think, well, because you know, that means to work more. No, it doesn't necessarily mean to work more. At times it might mean to work more. Because there are seasons in life when we have to work more. And that's, that's a whole other story. But when you are working is when you work the very, very best that you can do. You can ask my wife and she would tell you one of my biggest pet peeves is when there's idleness. She would, she would agree with it. She would say, yes, my husband hates idleness. Now, I, now ironically, the, the ministry involves talking to people and, and doing these things, but I, I can't just sit around either. I got I to get something done. And sometimes it's not always visible. Sometimes you don't always see the, what's, what's, what's happening. There's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes and in the background, but, 
But I don't like just sitting around. I like being, I like having a plan. And my, my, I ask my wife all the time, like, so what did you get done? <laughs> She's my wife, and she, she bears this really well. I'm like, what would you do? What did you get done? You know, okay, what's next? I say, what's next? What are we doing? It's, it's not just, can't just be, and ask, ask Rebecca. She's been here long enough to know that I just, I hate that just, you know, we're just sitting around in the kitchen. It's like, okay, well, collectively, we sat around and talked for 25 minutes, and there's five of us in this room. That's a lot of time. You know, that's a lot of time. So I'm really excited, and I want to get to work, and I want to get something done, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to work longer. So we have to be careful and balance this. Because you also have a family. You also have to be concerned about your health. You also have to make it to church. You also have to do all of these other things. And I get all of that. But when you are working, we should be working. And never look at this as a punishment. It's going to be hard. But you know what? This is God's plan for us. That we work. And we can actually begin to enjoy it. Friends, one of the things that I enjoy so much is sharing the gospel. I, en- I enjoy that so much. Now right here, this is you and me in this wallet is our sin. The Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. A lot of people think that turning over a new leaf, going to a church, getting water baptized, giving money is what saves them. It's not what saves them. The Bible says that the wages of the sin, the wages of the sin is death. Okay? Somebody had to make the payment for this, and they couldn't make the payment through water, through walking an aisle, through money, through raising a hand. The payment was someone had to die. Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, came to this earth, and he died on the cross for our sin. Someone had to make the payment. Now, if you make that payment, you'll die and spend an eternity separated from God. But when Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years ago and died on the cross, he said, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. It's not of water baptism. It's not of being good or turning over a new leaf. It's not of raising a hand or giving money or joining a church. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. There will be no braggers in heaven. It says, I got here because I did something right. The reason you get to heaven is because you trusted in someone who is perfect, and that's Jesus Christ. And when you, in the quietness of your mind, accept that free gift of salvation, you have what's called eternal life. It doesn't get any better than that. Eternal life. You can't screw it up bad enough to lose it. How does that make you feel? I love that. I can't mess this thing up bad enough. I can do all the bad things. And now listen, I'm not endorsing that. I'm not saying go out and do it. I'm not saying live a wicked life. I'm saying God forbid. But I still can't lose my salvation. And I thank God for that. I thank God that he holds me in his, po- and in his hand. That's what it says in John chapter 10. It says that we are kept saved by the power of God unto salvation. And so simple faith alone in Jesus Christ alone is what secures our eternity with him. Marvelous. Marvelous. I pray that if there's anybody here that hasn't done that today, that they'd do it. And I believe everybody here has done it. But it's our responsibility to go out and share that. Now, go out and share that with people. And get them saved. Get them, get them to trust Christ as their Savior. How blessed is it to know that when you die, you're going to spend an eternity with God. is that amazing? It's amazing we can know that. Now share that with others.